Managing Editor of Analog Science Fiction and Fact. And we're about to dive into our writers panel. So how this is going to go is each author is going to read about an eight minute excerpt of their piece. I'll introduce them with their bio before they read. And then after each reading, we'll do a little bit of uh, panel questions from me, and then we'll turn to the audience and give you a chance to ask questions. All right, and um, just please wait until that time for any questions you might have. Okay, we're gonna start off. Well, first I'll introduce the entire panel. Frank Wu, Allison Wilgitz, Leia Seipitz, Phoebe Barton, and Jay Werkheiser. All right, the first uh, excerpt that we're going to hear is from Phoebe. Phoebe Barton is a queer trans science fiction writer. Her short fiction has appeared in venues such as Analog, On Spec, and anthologies from Bundoran Press and Alliteration Inc. She is currently writing the interactive fiction game The Tunnel Crew for Choice of Games. She lives with a robot in the sky above Toronto and is represented by Kim May Kirtland at Howard Morheim Literary Agency. She serves as an associate editor at Escape Pod and she is a 2019 graduate of the Clarion West Writers Workshop. All right, Phoebe. All right, thank you. And uh, I had the incredible foresight to forget the issue at home that I was going to be reading from, so I'm going to be reading from my phone instead. This uh, story is a, a square of flash, a cube of steel, which was printed in the September-October 2019 issue of Analog. And this is a story about isolation, self-determination, and giant queer ladies. None of it would have been beautiful if it lasted forever. Felicity Chagravetti tightened her grip around Eureka's smallest finger and felt at peace next to her girlfriend, sheltered from the world. Below them, the bay shone in the moon La Mancha's half-bright daylight, and the forest ran unbroken to the shore. I don't want to rush you, Felicity said, but much longer and you'll miss the eclipse. Just finishing it up now, Eureka said. She wasn't just low gravity tall, but gigantic, engineered to fit into a world that pulled only lightly on her bones, and her handheld screen was correspondingly large. She made a flourish with her stylus and beamed the finished drawing to Eureka's own screen. There, take a look at that. At first, it was like seeing a stranger with a face the same shape as a friend's, but after a moment, the contours of chin and cheek and nose arranged themselves into stark familiarity. The skin was a right shade of brown, the eyes properly green. It was her and not her. It was what she might look like polished, smoothed down, rather than being left incomplete. It was a face she might have seen in the mirror if any of a galaxy's worth of options for gender affirmation had been available to her, if there had been any justice in the world. When you look at me, Felicity said, is this what you see? When I look at you, I see what the light lets me see, Eureka said. She motioned to the sun, already shaved into a thinning crescent as the gas giant Quixote slipped between it and La Mancha like a jealous sibling who wanted all the attention. Isn't that enough? The eclipse was unlike anything on Mars. She remembered her mother, eager and bright, stuffing her into a suit and calling her a name she'd realized was sour poison so that they could watch tiny Phobos glide across the sun. Felicity hadn't found anything impressive about it. Eclipses on Mars were the half-finished distractions of a half-finished world. The sun went from a crescent to a sliver, and from a sliver to nothing. Night swept across La Mancha like a scythe, but whatever Felicity saw wasn't what Eureka was seeing. It couldn't be, with eyes that collected so much more light. It was another little truth that left her empty in the middle, that between their sight and size and so much else, there were things they couldn't share. Wasn't a relationship supposed to be about sharing? It must be so much more beautiful for you, Felicity said. I wish I could understand it. Oh, it's easier than you think, Eureka said. It takes time and work to become more than we are. Patience. Felicity sighed and looked up into the constellation dappled sky as a new star flared into being just for an instant. A ship had come through the warp point. She squinted at the patch of sky where it had presented, traced the stars, and felt a chill. It had erupted among the stars of the peregrine 
the traveler, the foreigner, the unwilling wanderer. There, Felicity said, that's a bad omen. There's nothing to worry about, Eureka said. I'm here, I've got you. They stayed until the sun emerged from the far side of Quixote and drowned the world in visible light, and only then did Felicity check her screen. With Eureka's drawing minimized, it reflected back to her face that looked too much like a man's face, a mask that had been stapled to her skull, a crumbling facade she wasn't allowed to replace and should never have been her problem at all. A message was waiting for her. It was the only thing it could ever have been. I can barely imagine it after so long, said Felicity's mother. Yesterday, the Martian Federation's ambassador to La Mancha, and today, just the Martian. Home. Such a simple word, but so heavy with meaning, especially when it was a lie. I can't, Felicity said. She cast her gaze out the window of a house that had never felt all that home-like, and was now only hers as a courtesy. Below were the multicolored roofs of Bay Seren, capital and largest city of La Mancha, huddled together like birds in a storm. I don't really want to either. You won't have to worry about a thing, her mother said. She'd fill the table with trinkets and breakables, scanning them so she could have them remade on Mars. The ship's going through a maintenance check. We won't be able to leave for some time yet. Plenty of time for you to make your adjustments and say your goodbyes. For you, maybe, Felicity said. As ambassador, her mother had lived in a fragile, evanescent world where words were weapons. No wonder she hadn't made connections. And if it hadn't needed maintenance, you'd have uprooted me like a weed, would you? Felicity, please, her mother said. You're still young. You have so many opportunities ahead of you. But this is a small world, and there are big opportunities back home for both of us. Felicity imagined herself pushing the table over and scattering everything to the wind. She could hear the shatters and clatters loudly enough that it was just as good as doing it for real. Sure, she was young, not quite 10 in Martian or La Mansion years, a bit over 17 to an earther, but that didn't mean she was foolish. La Mancha might have been cold, but it wasn't a desert. I have a life here, Felicity said, filling her voice with acid until it spilled. I have friends here. I told you about the school I applied for. They have an incredible set of programs. I want to study here. Just because you're here now, you don't have to act like it'll be forever, her mother said. You're comparing a world of 50,000 people to a system filled with billions. Felicity could read the unspoken words behind her mother's smile. You're afraid. You think you're not good enough. You'd rather deal with as little competition as possible. They were the same thing she told herself in the dark hours during La Mancha's long, long nights. She had no trouble believing them. Besides, they're doing great things with medical science back home, her mother said. Maybe they've found a solution. Felicity froze like a waterfall in winter. A solution. Even before she'd left Mars, she'd known the body she'd been born into wasn't the one she was meant to have. Bad luck on the genetic lottery. All the standard treatments, so the doctors said, were too dangerous for her to pursue. Superficial work had never satisfied her. Nearly 10 long years, and she'd never truly seen herself in a mirror. Have they? Felicity couldn't let herself be swept up by might, of, might be so's. Or is that just hope? It's whatever you want it to be, her mother said. I'm sorry that you're having trouble, but the truth is that this isn't our world. It's time to go home. Felicity could picture it well enough. Red dust, butterscotch skies, dirty domes, pumps full of endlessly recycled air that smelled like sweat and farts. No cool breezes, no soft grasses beneath her bare feet, not a hint of life. Quixotic outposts on a dead world, nothing more. If the entire world around her was dead, how could she ever feel alive? Thank you so much, Julia. Our next reader is going to be Leia Sipis. Leia Sipis sold her first story while in high school then gave in to her mother's importuning to be practical and study biology and the law. However, she is now a full-time writer with numerous published short stories, including two published in Analog this year. She is also the author of four young adult fantasy novels, including Mistwood and Death Swarm. Leah grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and has since lived in Boston and in the DC area. 
You can find out more about her writing and her other interests at her website, www.leahsifus.com, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, so I'm going to be reading from her story, Parenting License, which was published in the March, April 2019 issue. Um, and like most of us, I will just be reading part of the story. Parenting License. When Melanie found out she was pregnant, she was still at least two years away from getting her parenting license. The only class she had taken was attachment parenting, and she wasn't even sure she had passed that. She sat in the examination room, staring blankly at the doctor, not quite processing what he had just said. Her placement test for toddler discipline lay on her lap, still unfinished. It was an essay question, her least favorite kind. You're in the playground and your two-year-old pushes another child off the slide. What would be the appropriate reaction according to your preferred parenting philosophy? Melanie's answer so far consisted of one sentence, pretend he's not my kid, which she had been trying to erase when the doctor walked in. When he gave her the news, her pencil dropped from her fingers, rolled across the examination table, and bounced on the tiled floor. Ms. Radcliffe. Dr. Faisal put the chart down and leaned forward. Melanie turned over the placement test so he couldn't see it. I hope you understand how serious this is. Melanie blinked at him. Nausea roiled through her, as it had for the past month, and now she knew why. I can't be pregnant, she said. But even as she said it, dates and events rolled through her mind, and she knew she was. She took a deep, gasping breath. I didn't do it on purpose. Dr. Faisal clearly didn't believe her, but he smiled kindly. I've taken the liberty of checking on your course progress. You've passed attachment parenting, and you're signed up for sleep training and breastfeeding, which is good. But you don't have time to take the rest of the classes in just seven months. Does your husband have a license by any chance? Melanie winced. Matt was a firm believer in the licensing program. She had heard him rant for hours about people who thought they could have kids without any clue what they were doing. She knew he had his reasons, but he was so fixated on the subject that the thought of arguing with him about it was exhausting. So she hadn't argued. She hadn't even thought seriously about whether she wanted to argue. She had simply agreed that they would both get licenses before she got pregnant. It wasn't like she would have to explain her decision. Everyone in her life would think she was doing the right thing. Well, everyone except Linda. The doctor was still waiting. She shook her head. Dr. Faisal looked unsurprised, and a flush crept over Melanie's cheeks. She wished she hadn't chosen to dress in jeans and a slightly stained t-shirt today. A part of her wanted to pull out her college degree and wave it at him. I'm not who you think I am. I'm not irresponsible and careless. I'm, I'm the kind of person who prepares for life. I will be a good mother. Though on second thought, that would probably create the opposite of the impression she wanted. Besides, she could hear Matt's voice in her head. Just because you're a nice person with good intentions, that doesn't mean you can be trusted with children. Children are hard. If good intentions don't equip you to train a dog or give a massage, why would they enable you to raise a human being? She opened her mouth, but Dr. Faisal had already moved on, his voice smooth and carefully non-judgmental. In order to be eligible for benefits, at least one parent needs to be licensed. Your insurance policy is very clear. They won't cover you if you have a child without getting licensed first. We can work out a payment plan, Melanie said, wishing again that she was wearing a business suit. <coughs> Don't worry. That's not what I'm concerned about. The statistics about children born to unlicensed parents? Well, never mind. Just make sure you get your license as soon as possible. Most of the pediatricians in this area won't accept unlicensed parents into their practice. Melanie's stomach turned over, and she bolted for the door, papers scattering as she went. She twisted the knob twice, then realized she was turning it the wrong way, just before she threw up all over the shiny blue-white floor of the examination room. Melanie had been planning to wait until after dinner before talking to Matt, but with every bite and every word, her tension grew. When Matt started telling her about the new, unworkable computer system they were installing in his office, which he thought was the most stressful thing that was going to happen to him that week, she couldn't take it. She blurted it out. I'm pregnant. Matt looked like she punched him in the stomach. He put his fork down and stared at her with his mouth hanging open, which had the unfortunate effect of revealing the chewed up chicken still in his mouth, <laughs> which had an even more unfortunate effect on Melanie's growing nausea. Now that she knew there was a reason for the roiling in her stomach, it had become impossible to ignore. How, Matt said finally. Mm -hmm. His accusatory tone sparked a welcome rage in Melanie. 
Unfortunately, the rage was completely unwarranted. She had already figured out the how, and it was, in fact, her fault. That's not important, she snapped. This is not about placing blame. Matt's eyes widened. Did you, Melanie? I know you weren't thrilled about waiting, but did you do this on purpose? Of course not. Good. Now she was entitled to be angry. Melanie rose to her feet. How can you say that? I would never do that to you. Matt took a deep breath and rested his head in his hands. Of course you wouldn't. I'm sorry. Just give me a minute to think. Worse and worse. Because while it was true that Melanie hadn't deliberately done anything, she couldn't swear that her carelessness hadn't been influenced by her lack of commitment to the licensing program. And the more she thought about it, the less sure she was. Maybe Linda was right, and she shouldn't have agreed to get licensed so easily. But she and Matt had an unspoken rule. Their arguments were won by whoever cared the most. Melanie had known that her periodic uncertainty about the licensing program, which was mostly due to Linda's influence anyhow, was no match for Matt's unwavering conviction. I'm the one who's sorry, Melanie said. I know this wasn't the plan, but it will be okay. There are organizations to support people who refuse to get licenses. They'll provide financial aid. We're not refusing. Matt lifted his head and she saw that his eyes were wet. I'm not going to pretend to be one of those morons who are against the licensing program. You know how I feel about this. Even now, five years after she met him, Matt didn't talk much about his childhood. She knew he'd been in and out of foster homes, and she knew his biological mother had been arrested for child neglect. But he tended to act as if his life had started at the age of nine, when he'd been adopted by a wonderful, if slightly overbearing, family. She knew his birth mother had broken his leg once. When she'd asked about it, he'd said, I was a wild kid, and she didn't know how to deal with me. But then his face had closed up, and she'd never asked again. But she had thought about it when they started the licensing program. Her best friend, Linda, had urged her to reconsider. She was the one who had told Melanie about the programs for conscientious objectors. But Melanie had remembered Matt's face, his careful, focused attention on the course schedule, his firm nod when the introductory lecturer had said, would you drive a car without lessons and assume you could figure it out as you went along? It had never been up for discussion. It still wasn't. So forget about the conscientious objector programs. The payment issue was something they would figure out together, even if she had no idea how. Matt had yet seen the doctor's bill, maybe it would be up for discussion once he did. But Melanie doubted it. Compromise had never been their strong point. We'll find a solution, she said weakly. I just, excuse me. Unfortunately, she didn't think well while puking, so no hint of a solution was forthcoming that night. The next day, Melanie called in sick to work and met Linda for coffee instead. She was sick, though apparently she was going to be sick for the next two months. It wasn't like she could just stop going to work during that time, something else to figure out later. Good for you, Linda declared with unfeigned delight. I didn't do it on purpose. Melanie had said this so many times that it sounded practiced, which made it sound like a lie. Linda went on without poison, without buzzing. Linda was very intelligent, but she had difficulty processing words that didn't fit her worldview. In a few years, the licensing program will be history anyhow. There's a lawsuit winding its way to the Supreme Court right now. If I had a few years, Melanie said, I could get a license. But you don't need a license. Linda leaned forward, almost knocking over Melanie's still full coffee. Don't buy into the propaganda. You don't need a bunch of so-called experts telling you how to raise your children. I need someone to tell me how, Melanie's voice rose. I'm not ready to be a mother. I don't even know how to change a diaper. Babies don't need diapers, Linda sat back. Diapers are only part of the licensing program because of corporate sponsors. <laughs> this is not helpful. <laughs> Melody forced herself to take a sip of her now lukewarm coffee. Like everything else in her life, it made her want to puke. I don't have the faintest clue of what to do right now. What vitamins should I be taking? What foods should I be avoiding? There are at least 200 books about how to be pregnant, and I haven't read a single one. Calm down, Linda said. If I had done the licensing program, my head would have been stuffed with all the stupid information about allergy prevention they believed five years ago. Instead, I asked all my questions on the Earth Moms group, and guess what? Now even the doctors are saying I was right. Melanie had heard a lot about Linda's Earth Mom group over the years, and she was pretty sure they weren't going to help her. She said, I respect your parenting style, but I'm a little more conventional. I want to use diapers, Linda sighed, and baby food, Linda snorted. And I want my baby to sleep through the night. Linda jerked back and Melanie stopped, wondering if her friend was about to walk out. Linda took a deep breath and closed her eyes. 
You'll do whatever's best for you, she said, with the air of someone making a very generous, very tolerant concession. <laughs> if you want to be more traditional about it, you still don't need to take classes. You'll learn the way women have learned for centuries from your mother. My mother gave me formula. Applause. Don't worry, Linda said, less convincingly. We'll figure something out. Thank you. Our next reader is Jay Werkheiser. Jay Werkheiser teaches chemistry and physics pretty much all the time. His stories are sneaky devices to allow him to talk about science in a sort of socially acceptable way. Much to his surprise, the editors of Analog and various other magazines, e-zines, and anthologies have found a few of his stories worth publishing. Many of those story ideas came from nerdy discussions with his daughter or his students. He really should keep an updated blog and author page, but he mostly wastes his online time on Facebook, MeWe, or Twitter, at Jay Werkheiser. Okay, um, this is a, a probability zero story from uh, 2017, I believe, it's called Phenol Fairy. Um, has some scary science terms in there, so I brought pictures of the science equipment as we go over it. Um, okay, Phenol Fairy. Um, what are you doing in the lab so late, Duncan? I swiveled my head around to see Gwen standing in the doorway, uh, just working on my dissertation research. I shifted my body to hide the vial on the workbench from her view. She grinned and walked over to me. Doesn't look like a polyamine synthesis. That's a polyamine. <laughs> in case you care. Um, I, I tried to slide the vial from the view nonchalantly. Yeah, uh, it's a side project. Ooh, nice crystals, sparkly. You, crystal you recrystallize it yourself? Busted. I held up the vial, letting her look at the iridescent powder inside. Promise you won't tell anyone about this? She took the vial from my hand, intrigued. It flows, almost like a liquid. She turned the vial from side to side, staring at the sparkling dust as it flowed back and forth. What is it? Promise you'll keep your mouth shut? You know me, Duncan. My lips are sealed. It's fairy dust. She gave me a hurt look. You don't want to tell me. Just say so. She opened the vial and peered inside. No, I'm serious. Careful. And where would you get fairy dust? The stockroom have a mythical substances shelf I don't know about? A um, troll told me about it. Um, she burst into laughter. Her hands shook just a bit, but enough to slosh some of the dust onto her thumb and forefinger. I suppose it lived under a wheatstone bridge in the physics lab? There's a wheatstone bridge. <laughs> <laughs> um, you better wash that off. I pointed to the shimmering powder smeared on her hand. Oh, it's tingly, all up my arm. What is this stuff? I told you. Damn it, Duncan, chemical exposure is serious. Oh, she wobbled like she was dizzy and about to fall over then lifted off her feet and floated gently toward the ceiling. I stepped back to avoid her, her thrashing legs. She screeched like a banshee who overshot her titration in point. Quiet, someone will hear you. To her credit, she stopped screaming and thrashing. Fine, how do I get back to the ground? She bobbed gently against the ceiling, arms folded like an angry parade balloon. I have no idea, and we just started analyzing what it's made of. She glared heat at me. Well, what's it made of? Near as I can tell, it's a low-density nanoparticle of some sort. I'd love to get some time on the electron microscope, but heh, try getting that past the provo uh, try getting that proposal past the department chair. <laughs> exactly. It has very low solubility in water, so I imagine the bonding is nonpolar. Not helping. But the sparkling seems to indicate banding of electron states, like metallic bonds. Not helping. What do you what do you want me to do? I don't know, run a sample through the GCMS maybe. That's a big scary GCMS. <laughs> um, if we can find out what it's made of, good idea. I took the vial from her carefully and injected a few microliters into the GCMS. While I waited for its results, I prepared a new Joel model to run through the IR. And that's an infrared. IR spectrum. Um, hey, Gwen, looks like the GCMS is ready. Can you reach down far enough to check the results? I'm going to run an IR spec. She glared at me, but pushed herself along the ceiling and she was over the GCMS readout. Weird, it's picking up quite a few phenyl uh, phenylamine compounds, including dimers and trimers. But there are several unidentified components. There's the output she saw. 
<laughs> Those are federal mean peaks, by the way. Um, IR agrees, I said. A lot of amino and phenol peaks, fingerprint region looks really strange, though. Fingerprint, fingerprint regions that squiggly part on the left. You're the polyamine expert. How does that make me float? It doesn't. So you look at her levitating body pointedly. Well, it shouldn't. Uh, phenol, polyphenol amines tend to be good antimicrobial agents for whatever good that does. Regardless, the molecules are too big to be absorbed through your skin. But what about the smaller units, like the dimers? Well, yeah, they could diffuse into your bloodstream, especially when dispersed in nanoparticles. What do they do there? They're good at promoting cell growth. They enhance activity of some neurotransmitter receptors. Some of them go through the blood-brain barrier. Wait, they can, go, they can go through my bloodstream, get in my brain, mess with my neuroreceptors? Her eyes went wide. I fidgeted it with the vial. I don't see how that would make you float. Maybe make you believe you can float, but that's not very helpful, don't you? No, wait, I think that's it. She looked at me like I just told her I like the smell of an hydrant. You're saying I'm floating because I think I'm floating? Why not? There are quite a few unknown compounds in the dust. Some can be highly psychotropic, and the polyamines can make you susceptible to their effects. So all I have to do is stop believing I can float. Uh, no, not that easy. You've seen yourself float. How are you gonna not believe it? What then? It just has to run its course. Shouldn't take more than a couple hours to pass through your body. She sighed. I don't know, it doesn't seem very scientific. Of course it is. We've made empirical observations, drawn conclusions, formulated hypotheses. <laughs> can't get much more scientific. You know what I mean. Science is all about discovering new phenomena. Okay, fine, just tell me you're done playing with new phenomena. I glanced sheepishly at the witch's broom and stopped her over my glass on my blood bench. Well. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. Our next reader is Allison Wilgus. Allison Wilgus is a Brooklyn based writer, editor, and cartoonist who primarily works in comics but her interest in short fiction led her to attend both Clarion West and Launchpad, and her stories have appeared in venues such as Analog, Interzone, and Strange Horizons. In her spare time, Allison and her co-host, Gina Gagliano, make Graphic Novel TK, a podcast about the nuts and bolts of graphic novel publishing. Allison's latest work is Cronin, a duology of historical SF graphic novels published by Tor Books. You can find her on Twitter and Instagram, as at Allie Wilkes. Um, I'm going to read the beginning of a story, book. A story called uh, Neighborhood for Someone Else, which I believe was in the May June issue of uh, Analog in 2019. Uh, a neighborhood for Someone Else. Chatty expats in waiting rooms often tell Berta how unsettling they find the local architecture. They confessed to her in two loud whispers that even the elevator's passenger car set them on edge. That here on the planet's surface, in the undulating valleys of alien streets, they feel constantly under siege. When Berta frowns, they quote some essay they all seem to have read about the inescapable foreignness of this urban geometry. They explain to her that every angle and plane is fundamentally at odds with how a human expects a room to be shaped, how a building should rise from the ground. Berta's shrug is a lie, but it tells the story she's chosen for herself, that she belongs on this planet, that she can build a home here, but not in this city, not in transition. More precisely translated, the city's alien name is Respite on the Salt Road to Who You Are Becoming. Today, Berta is becoming a permanent resident. She's reached the end of her own road at last. She will meet with her immigration caseworker tonight, and in the hours between now and then, an acquaintance will distract her with a play. She's on her way to meet them when she pauses at the apex of a bridge over the river. From here, she can already see the flicker of lit signs in human scripts, blinking at her from between jagged profiles of alien townhouses. The acquaintance, Kath, isn't expecting her for another quarter hour, and so Berta can afford a few minutes to enjoy the view. She watches as crowds filter into the open-air theaterettes that line the riverbank, the opaline gorgon blurs of aliens seen at a distance. Then she turns and stands with her back to the river, her fingertips on the too-low railing, 
and she soaks in the conversation of passers-by, catching a sibilant, reedy whisper, the flick of a crest, a sour whiff of friendliness. She can tell which of these aliens will follow the road all the way into the expat neighborhood. Those beleaguered souls waft floral grimness, wear plugs in their ears and masks pulled over their noses or rather what Berta calls ears and noses when she thinks in her native tongue. A human alone can be tolerated, but no alien would suffer unshielded through the crashing, chaotic, stinking roar of hundreds of humans together, blithely and blind, blindly living out their lives, their voices and their bodies all shouting at once. Berta savors the peace of the bridge while she's able. She breathes in deep of river brine and tidy pheromones. Then she smears a film of peppermint oil under her nostrils and walks down to the far bank of the river through sea urchin shapes of cheap alien housing into the enclave of concrete and right angles where Kath is waiting for her. The alien word for where the expats live is a sweet, sweet puff of exhaustion and muttered breath which translates to something like sweaty noise village. Humans call it the neighborhood, a little pocket of bees which they have carved for themselves in the years since their embassy opened. First a block of apartments, then a market, then a coffee shop, pushing outward one building at a time until they swallowed the old alien perfume district whole. The blaring creep of the neighborhood has reached a little further since Berta was last here, out on the southernmost tip of this island city. That must have been a whole chime ago of not longer. Her work and her apartment are both near the daughter of a bitter such sal, salt salt <laughs> alien words are hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> the daughter of a bitter salt sun consulate, which in turn is nestled in a ring of dignitary housing. Alien dignitaries there on alien business, which even Berta only understands in fragments. Most humans are content to ignore Berta or haven't been in transition long enough to hear the jokes about her. Kath either hasn't heard them or didn't care when she first met Berta in the immigrant services waiting room, and over time her vague friendliness has intensified into a campaign. Like most of the expats, Kath is bemused by the quiet women with the olfactory implants and effective gestures. Uniquely, she's made a project of Berta's isolation. Now Kath waves to Berta from a small table just inside the cafe. Looks like we're celebrating, she says as Berta takes a ginger seat. She's smiling and she smells of beer. Got the news on my way out of the office. Your visa, Berta says. What else could it be? Apparently, they just want me up to speed before second bell, so they paid to have my application expedited. Cass' laughter is self-conscious, a little rueful. I thought I'd get to take a little vacation, but I guess it'll be better this way. I'll bring last year's count with me when I do my bounce. That's plenty of time to make a dent anyway. A bounce is a formality, a trip up the elevator and back, off world and on, to reset oneself into a newcomer. When one steps into the human side of the station, one exits the domain of alien law. Bird has made the loop eight times herself, five bell visas strung together with stints at cheap orbital hostels. She'll be allowed two more passes through immigration before they flag her file. Bird orders a coffee and sips it black, while Kath ticks through her list of perfunctory errands and paperwork. They make you jump through so many hoops, Kath says. She rolls her eyes and takes a bite of her quiche. God, this island, right? It's like their primary export is red tape. The joke is old and alien, although none of the expats seem to know that. A better translation would be, a respite on the salt road has nothing to give you but who you will become. For centuries before humans first punched their way out of a gravity well, alien emigrants and immigrants have flowed through the channels of transitions bureaucracies, hoping to become someone other than who they've been. Berta sometimes imagines she can smell their cautious hope, soaked deep into the walls of the processing center, the courthouse, the consulates where she has waited each week with a bundle of administrative incense in her lab. Berta presses her mug against her chin and breathes in coffee and peppermint. When do you move, she asks. Oh, they want me to take over the branch in port salt, in brine rot hope of dissonant friends, Berta thinks to herself. But I'm not sure about the timeline yet. They're sending me to a workshop, I don't know. Apparently the aliens on staff all hated the last supervisor. 
cat sighs and takes another bite. I don't think any of the expats in the office can hold the conversation and adapt it. Someone in HR has been pretty lax about fluency. Her eyes flick up. Are you sure you, I'm not certified for technical documents, Berta says, and then adds, and I can't interpret when Kath opens her mouth to protest. That's a completely different skill set. You could explain what it means when the aliens smell like old socks, Kath says. You could tell me what the difference is between a frill wiggle and a frill shape. The aliens don't have frills. Berta knows what Kath means, but now she's annoyed as well as nauseous from the smell of pastry and butter which a peppermint shield can't entirely overwhelm. Deliberately, she slips her calm out of her pocket and glances at the time. Don't worry, the venue is right around the corner, Kath says. I think you'll really like this adaptation. It's supposed to be severely faithful to the original. And then they go see a very poorly translated play, which is the beginning of a very long afternoon for Berta. <laughs> Thank you, Allison. Our final reader today is Frank Wu, who I believe has a multimedia presentation for you in addition to uh, a reading. Frank Wu is a trans-dimensional interspace being, living physically near Boston with his wife, Brianna the Magnificent, but regularly projecting his mind across time and space to commune with dinosaurs, eurypterids, and numerous energy beings. Visu visualizations and written accounts of these journeys can be found in analog, Amazing Stories, Realms of Fantasy, FrankWu.com, and the Radiation Hardened Memory Bunkers of Planet Gorse Blacks. <laughs> Take it away, Frank. Okay, so Jason, I might need your help to, I'm actually gonna be over there so I can, so I can hit the next button. Yes. All right. Uh, oh wait, is there a way that like so I can preview the next slide? Or is there no? Okay, all right, fine. That's fine. Okay. Uh, in the absence of instructions to the contrary, um, this is actually won the the Anlam Award for Best Short Story, which is probably my proudest achievement ever. Um, then the illustration was by um, Vincent DeFate, who doesn't quite accurately. To draw the robot as described in the story, but that's okay because he's Vincent the fan, he can do whatever he wants. <laughs> um, okay. In the absence of instructions to the contrary, Carl 3478 sprawled on the beach, partially disassembled. Diving planes and ducted propellers all waited clean up, tear down, and rebuild. He was performing a major overhaul on himself for deep sea worthiness. Underwater, Carl was untethered, but freedom came with risks. No one would help him or rescue him. Wrapped around his claw tip was a black O-ring, one of his smallest parts, but most important. It fit into the end of electronic sleeve three, and this little ring, with a little grease, was all that prevented water from rushing into the sleeve and destroying everything inside. Only a smear of marine-grade silicone grease was necessary. A blob of grease would break off, allowing the water in. And so with no violation of all protocols, Carl squeezed out a huge glob of grease. And this he would do in full consideration of his love for Adeline. Ad Dr. Adeline Franzen had given him two commands. Observe marine life, but do not interfere. Earlier, aquanauts thought nothing of poking fish to get better camera angles. Carl wouldn't do that. And unlike a human, he could stay underwater for years, studying entire life cycles uninterrupted. But his observations would be spoiled if he frightened his subjects. And so he camouflaged himself with corals, and he had beheld the wonders of the deep. <laughs> the bathyterid fish with their fins modified into stilts, walking the bottom like circus clowns, and the acorn worms, worms leaving beautifully coiled fecal trails like Nazca lines on the seafloor, and the oarfish, with its head held proudly, crowned with the crest of fins, with a body long like a cathedral train of a royal white, white wedding gown. These marvels he had recorded for his Adeline. Adeline. Though he had yet to declare himself, 
she would realize his feelings towards her, wouldn't she? And so, when the time came for his first check-in, Carl beached himself on his little deserted island, and decades before, sailors had used it to store Agent Orange and mustard gas and stuff like that. But now the military was gone, leaving the island a wildlife preserve without people, a land of wonders. And now was the time to report on those wonders. Describing the wonders would be easy, not like telling how many know. Dear Dr. Adeline Franson, I have completed my first five year study, and as requested, I have observed without interfering. Oh, Adeline, I wish you weren't so far away. You and I are of a kind. Perhaps we are short and squat on land, but in the water we are magnificent. Others taught me how to maintain precise depth, but you taught me underwater ballet. Others taught me how to read scientific papers, but you taught me how to write them, how to think like a scientist, how to feel like a poet appreciating the sea in all of its aspects. Like Emerson, I have seen so many beautiful things, even in the mud and scum, are always, always something sane, but none as beautiful as you. In the attached reports, I list 30 new species, each one named after you. <laughs> Yours. <laughs> Hours later, I'm going to uh, hours later, the reply came from the um, University of, of Hawaii. Dear Carl, has been five years already? Wow, time flies. I'm pleased that you are operating within specifications. Your reports are meticulous. It won't take that long to make them publishable. And while it is your prerogative as discoverer of new species to name them as you wish, it is neither necessary nor informative to name them all after me. <laughs> I appreciate your enthusiasm, but some of the new species you propose may not be. You may be cherry-picking facts to support preformed conclusions. We're all very proud of you. Glad to see you working independently. And while I appreciate your adhering to my advice to observe but not disturb, please do not just do what I ask you to do. Do what you think is right. You may not, then you may not just be the author, but the subject of scientific inquiry. Yours, at P.S. I've been using about the octopus lately. If you ever get a chance, I'd be pleased if you studied some octopuses. I'd be eager to see what they and you were capable of doing. So what did this mean? Scientific papers were easy to understand, but not personal letters. Adeline had said that she was proud of him, that his work was meticulous, enthusiastic, and most importantly, he was operating within specifications. What could be higher praise? Buoyed by these com uh, compliments, he knew now he should declare himself. <sighs> Dear Adam, I can contain my heart no longer. I named all these species after you because I love you. I love you. Do you remember how once we read the Song of Solomon together and then discussed the biodiversity listed therein? <laughs> <laughs> you treat me. It's not just a scientist, but a poet. And thus, it is appropriate that I use this medium to express my love for you, the loveliest thing in the oceans. How beautiful you are, my beloved. You are like a, oh, wait. You are like a Venus flower basket among the cup corals. Your eyes sparkle like the flashlight fish, and your hair floats tentacular like a lion mane, jelly, uh, lion mane jellyfish. Your breasts are globular and luminous like comb jellies in the moonlight, and your feet are as lovely as giant marine isopods. <laughs> Nay, you are more lovely than a dozen mantis shrimps. I love you so much, Emily. Love, Carl, lovingly. <laughs> Carl passed several more agonizing hours before he received her response. Dearest Carl, I don't know what to say. Uh, I am charmed and flattered and amused by your profession of love. Uh, I am pleased and impressed by you and your work, and I admit a deep well of affection for you. You've always been my favorite student. Uh, but love is simply not necessary 
for you to use that word to describe your feelings towards me. Human robot relationship is not an experiment I wish to attempt at this time. Uh, I'm hoping to be promoted to the head of the department soon, and I'm almost healed, so I might start diving again. But now I have remote equipment all around the world sending me more data than my grad students could possibly process. I have even too much on my plate for, for this right now. I'm sorry, Carl. I'm sorry if that hurt your feeling. Adeline. So what did this mean? He was, he was her favorite, and he had charmed her. He had flattered her to the point that she had a deep level of affection for him. Perhaps she was diving again, so she could come dive with him. She had said it was not necessary for him to use the word love, but she had not specifically commanded him not to. <laughs> Thus, in the absence of unambiguous and specific instructions to the contrary, he would continue to say, I love you. And he would continue to love her until forbidden. And even then, he might not stop. After all, had not poets written that love rules over all? Humans are so hard to understand. He thought back to the Greek myths, which he had studied because Adeline had mentioned them once in passing. And had not the hero beleaguer Wound, uh, wooed the huntress Atalanta with the gift of the head of the Caledonian boar. This had clearly established the precedent of expressing love with gifts of unique and dangerous biological specimens. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is why Adeline had challenged him to study octopuses. Hadn't Victor Hugo once described these man-killing beasts as having arms as strong as steel and as cold as night? And she vowed he would study these monster octopuses for Adeline until she succumbed to his affections. And he would demand that Adeline take his feelings as seriously as she took his science. And so Carl dove back into the deeps to prove his love for Adeline. And that's the end of the first part of the story. <laughs> because nobody used it yet, so I thought it might be cursed. <laughs> well, for my story, I ended up, I did do a lot of preliminary research. Uh, it did help for this one that this was actually the second rewrite, the second writing of the story using the same setting. So I was able to, to have the benefit of years of uh, 
putting this together. I did have to do multiple rounds of calculation to determine the nature of the Moon La Mancha because, well, first of all, it is made up that the planet it orbits is real. Quixote is uh, also known as Mu RAB. It was named by the IAU at the end of 2015 and started me off with the idea for the story in the first place, but I really needed to do multiple rounds of calculations to figure out just the nature of a moon that was small enough, but dense enough to have low gravity, but not so small and so low gravity that it couldn't hold on to an oxygenated atmosphere. So that was the most important thing that I had to do because I just really needed to have these numbers and these results so I could believe in the place enough for that to come through in the writing, even though none of that information actually did. Thank you. I guess I'll go next. I should be in the middle since um, my answer is that I didn't really do any research. This is a classic write what you know story. Um, I have four kids. Three of them were born in Boston, which is the kind of place where people come to hospitals with laminated birthing plans. Um, and I have a told with a straight face that babies don't need diapers at all. I'm not talking like you know, cloth diapers versus regular diapers, I'm talking any diapers. Um, <laughs> um, you know, and I belonged at the time to a lot of Facebook parenting groups, and, you know, I probably wrote a fair number of stories just as annoying from being on these groups. <laughs> My research was wasting time on Facebook. And it was useful. <laughs> Okay. I don't think there was very much science in my story, so <laughs> um, the lab equipment I actually worked with, so I didn't have too much research there, but on um, the polyphenolamines, I had to look up what they do, and I needed compounds that would cross the blood-brain barrier, so I did some chemistry research, strangely enough. <laughs> I have an entire shelf like this of research for that story, all about, like, I read an entire book about how to disassemble a submersible, and um, it, it takes place on a real island, which is the Johnson Atoll, which is near Hawaii. And I'm like, what kind of animals are going to be there? So I looked it up, and oh my god, somebody had actually written a thesis called A Survey of the Animals in the Johnson Atoll. I'm like, yes, on eBay. I will, I will pay you $20 for that. And I was like, great, thank you. Um, but I, I do have to admit that the, the one inspiration wasn't a book but it was a cartoon, a XKCD cartoon, of the, um, one of the Mars rovers. And he's like, analyzing rocks. He's like, okay, it's day 1,000, and if I analyze these rocks really well, I get to go home after 3,000 days, right? <laughs> it's like, shit, it's been 4,000 days. I thought I did a really good job analyzing that rock. Uh, 5,000 days, like, I'm, real, I'll, I'll try to do a better job analyzing the next rock. Can I go home now, guys? I was like, oh, so sad. <laughs> little robot. Yeah. Thank you. I, I felt like I wanted to start with that question because I think uh, the amount of research that you all do is incredible and deserves to be heard by everyone, but also is part of what makes an analog author an analog author. Um, my first question that you have all been prepared for. I think we'll probably just go down the line to make things easier on this one, if that makes sense, starting with Jay. Just what is your history and relationship with the magazine? Okay, um, I was reading analog since probably I could read, so, and the, I knew I was gonna write for it one day, I just, there was no option. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I actually, uh, my first story was published there in 2009, so this is my 10th anniversary. Your guys' 90th anniversary. Wonderful. I wish I could say that I'd been reading Analog since a kid because I know I would have really appreciated it, but I didn't know it existed back then because of the fun stuff of newsstand distribution. I started reading it in 2007 as part of research and trying to figure out like, what was going on in the short story markets. and how to write and sell short stories. I made my first sale in June of uh, 2012 to Stan Schmidt. 
and that was just before he announced his retirement, and I'm sure those two things are entirely unrelated. <laughs> but it, it's been, I've been published there for going on seven years now, and have somehow not alienated Trevor Cashery enough for him to keep buying some of the things that I sell him, that I send him. Um, so, I did read um, Analog, Asimov's, and FNSF as a kid because they were all in the public library. Um, so I used to go to the public library and kind of read old magazines and figure out who might publish my stories. And I was a teenager at the time, and at the time I was like, well, these three magazines will clearly never publish my stories. <laughs> um, which at the time I was, I was probably right, um, but many years later, I had managed to fulfill that dream, and Analog was actually the last to fall. <laughs> so my history with Analog is just beginning. I published my first two stories with Analog um, this year, and that hopefully it's the beginning of my history. Yes. Uh, so I read uh, stories published in Analog and Asimov, mostly in like various other kind of being republished in collections that I was reading as like a teenager. Yeah various classes that I was taking in my own personal time. Um, I came to Analog, uh, it wouldn't have occurred to me to submit probably, uh, but when I was attending uh, Clarion West in 2014, I actually wrote the story that would later become my first Analog story, uh, A Barrow for the Living, which is about a sort of semi-failed Mars mission. And one of my classmates afterwards come, came up to me and she was like, I want you to submit this to places like Analog and Asimov's and kind of these old school science fiction magazines because I want to read this kind of story by you as this kind of author. And I was like, oh, that's really nice of you. And then of course I was like, oh, but they're never gonna publish me. So I think I sent it to like literally everywhere else first. Uh, and then I was like, well, I mean, everybody else has rejected this story, so I guess I'll waste my time sending it to Analog, which will never publish it. And then I think Trevor bought it within like a month. And I'm like, okay. Well, that'll teach me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, anyway. So, when I was little, I think it's 1973, the first three science fiction novels I read were Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, Martian Chronicles, which technically isn't a novel, it's a story cycle, but whatever, and Forever War, which remains one of my favorite favorite um, novels, but Joe Haldeman, military science fiction. Go read it if you haven't. It's, it's awesome. And, and at the same time, I was like, well, I was kind of nerdy, so I was also reading like books about science fiction and the history of science fiction. I was like, oh, well, the Forever War originally was a short story called Hero that appeared in Analog. Oh, what's, what's that? And then it just, oh, Dune was in there too. Oh, I've heard of that. Oh, that's, and like all this cool stuff. So like, yeah, I've heard about Analog for a long time. And um, the, the first story that Trevor bought for me, hey Trevor, um, it, it took me 15 years to write that thing. And it, it was like, it was, it was giving me my, my last shot at writing because I'd done some science fiction art and stuff like that. It's like, I'm gonna try and get this thing published. If no one takes it, it's like, I'm done writing. I'm just gonna like, you know, just keep doing art. And like, Trevor bought it. I'm like, oh my god, this is awesome. And um, yeah, so I guess, I guess I'm writing now. <laughs> <laughs> and we're glad. <laughs> um, so my next question is, what role, if any, do STEM fields play in your fiction? I know Jay will certainly have an answer for this one. Yeah, a lot of STEM in my stuff, right? Um, I. I like all the sciences, of course, because I'm a nerd. Um, but I noticed that I was a chemistry major, so that's my love. And I noticed there's a lot of stories that involve physics. And there's you know, black holes, neutron stars, the whole works. Um, there's a lot of stories involving biology and cloning and genetic engineering, but poor chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided I would adopt it. Um, and so I try to write stories that have a, a, a chemistry basis to them. And I go over to biochemistry because that's interesting too, but a little biology. Um, so that's um, yeah, my relationship to the STEM fields is I do a lot of chemistry in my stories. 
I unfortunately don't. I unfortunately don't have that kind of background myself. I studied history in school because it never occurred to me I could actually be a scientist or uh, get involved in STEM fields. But I do have that sort of post-school inclination. So a lot of it is me just trying to figure out things, the sort of thing I want to do, and then do just enough reading online that I can fake like I know something about it. <laughs> which, which works out fine because I, I'm not showing people my notes or my results except when I take pictures of them and post them on Twitter because I'm like that sometimes. Um, so my background is that I am a biology major. Um, and at one time I was actually thinking of becoming a researcher, although when it turned out that I could not actually get E. coli to grow in a petri dish, um, that career took a sharp turn. Um, so when I do use science in my stories, it tends to be biology. Um, I also feel it's true that chemistry is, is treated even less well than biology in the science fiction field, but I also feel like biology um, could, could stand to be more stories. Although the honest truth is that I'm really more interested in like sociology and psychology and actually you know history, seeing how fast changes have affected people in the past and trying to extrapolate um, to how they'll affect people in the future than I am in any of the um, hard sciences. Uh, so I've been really interested in, for a long time, about writing science fiction that is both very grounded in the practical and in reality, because I think it's it's an interesting challenge to tell exciting science fiction stories while also adhering to like, I mean, as much as I love Star Trek, it's magic in space, right? So trying to tell exciting science fiction stories that are like having to deal with the realities of moving humans around in a tin can is like really cool, um, but also have those stories be about human relationships and characters that I personally relate to, because usually I get either one of those things, but not both at the same time. So that's what I, I, I like to do. Um, and then I wrote, uh, actually, there's a series, I could spend an hour just talking about how this happened, but I ended up writing a nonfiction graphic novel that's about the feature of human space flight and also about uh, you know very a little bit of planetary geology and that kind of uh, planetary sciences. Um, and in writing that graphic novel kind of took a sort of hobbyist interest in this and kind of really dug down deep into it now. Uh, in addition to my Mars story that was published by Analog, I'm also uh, trying to find other venues to kind of, well, now I know all of this stuff, so let's see how much mileage I can get out of this. Uh, so right now, actually, I'm, I'm working on a, a graphic novel for kids that's both a sort of divorced family story, like little girl and her two moms who kind of get along with each other, but, you know, they're in space. Like, one lives on a space station, the other one's like a cool freighter pilot. And I'm actually, when Phoebe was talking about uh, her moon problem, like, oh, yeah, I'm having the moon problem. <laughs> like, people gonna live on it. Can we, can it be rock? Like, how big does it have to be? Radiation? <laughs> like, because again, I, I don't. I, there's a little bit of hand waving if you're going a few hundred years in the future, but it's important to me that teachers can use this graphic novel. That's like a fun graphic novel. It's an adventure in space. But I also want them to be able to be like, okay, but all of these things that they're dealing with are real things. So if you're interested in this, you can take a book out and learn more about how this actually works. Because I, I feel like I didn't get a lot of that when I was a kid, so yeah, we'll see. Uh, like with the whole moon thing, like there's <laughs> there's like, okay, a moon large enough to, uh, to keep an atmosphere, but is it to keep a stable atmosphere or to keep an atmosphere that can just replenish fast enough, faster than it bleeds out into the space? So as long as you're pumping out oxygen, is that is that gonna work? It's like, is, is that a question? It's a question I'm asking the universe until we actually get to the moons and then we can actually do this in person. And um, anyway, um, moons, man. Moons, yeah. Oh, not a moon, that's a space station. Um, uh, so my background is uh, my undergrad degree is in English, um, uh, gave medieval studies, right? Uh, because one of, the, one of the important things for me is that the, a story has to have an emotional core and that you have to like, care about the characters and like why, why the things that are happening are important to the characters and what it means to them on an emotional anyway, And then after I was an English major, um, I went and got a degree in um, bacterial genetics, which is a really hard transition. Um, so my day job is I actually do patent law for a biotech company. 
and I really like biology. So my first story in analog was about ants, and the second one was about octopuses, and the third one was about centipedes, so I really like invertebrates. <laughs> <laughs> and Tre Trevor said when I was uh, sending him the story, it's like, I am both fascinated and creeped out by centipedes. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> He's not a fan. <laughs> But he bought my story, so that's, that's okay. Okay, it looks like we only have slightly over 10 minutes left, and I do want to allow the audience to ask some questions. So I'm just going to very quickly compress my last few questions into one and do like a lightning round and then open it up to the audience. So my very compressed question is, in your time, however long it may be, with analog, how have you seen your own work evolve, the magazine evolve, and what would you like to see in the future for analog, and what would you like to see remain the same? You don't have to answer all four of those questions, but maybe just address one of those things. Go. For my purposes, uh, personally, like in terms of how my uh, writing has changed and what and what I would like to see in analog is the same answer with uh, more queer people, both in terms of characters and in terms of writers as well, because I think that's an interesting perspective. But yeah, that's that's my opinion. Great, thank you, Phoebe. Did Jacob? Okay. Okay. As far as my writing evolved. Um, I want to apologize for Stan for some stories in the 70s I sent him. <laughs> so they may be both quite a bit. Um, um, what I, the I haven't seen a lot. Of, there's some, some change in analog, but um, it's evolving over time as the, the field progresses. But overall, analog has remained the same in that it's about people using science to overcome problems. And yeah, and what you guys said in the end of this panel, um, optimistic stories about how we can meet the future and win. So I think that, at its heart, has been what analog is and will be, at least as long as Trevor's there, right? Thank you, Jay. Um, given the compressed time of my history, I feel like I should have to do the time by skipping your question. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll talk about, so in terms of my own writing, so this story has actually, is actually the original version of it was written eight years ago. Um, it was like it kind of a very serious story in which like the government was trying to force people like you know not to have children and you know basically all my computer groups rightfully tore it apart. It was terrible. Um, and what happened was that I started kind of reading more outside my genre. Um, and at some point I was actually reading a chiclet novel and I closed the book and I was like, oh that's the tone I need for this story. <laughs> and I I rewrote it from scratch. So I don't know if you knew you were accepting a chiclet. <laughs> uh, I, I feel like the this my own personal experience, but also sort of watching other people go through this process, is I feel like uh, Analog has done a really good job in the last few years of uh, opening its doors very deliberately to a wider variety of people, and I feel like we all tell each other not to self-project and then immediately do so. Uh, and, I, and I feel like I'm better about that than I used to be, and I'm also spending a lot of time trying to talk other friends of mine who tell me quietly about how they're writing short fiction. I'm like, okay, but then you should send it out. And probably you'll get a lot of form rejections, and that's fine. Have your have your friend take care of your inbox for you if it stresses you out. But you should do it because you. I mean, as a person who also works in comics, like writing short is hard for anybody. It's a really useful exercise for people who do comics because you have to be so much more efficient with your storytelling when you have to also draw it. Um, and I and I feel like the field it benefits from people moving from one genre to another genre and one medium to another medium. And so I really kind of become accidentally uh, a person who spends a lot of time encouraging science fiction, fantasy, prose people to come hang out with us in comics and vice versa. And I hope that I, some of my cartoonist friends submit stories to Trevor sooner rather than later. Thank you. I've, I've read once that a lot of the great movies, like David Lean movies, are about like a change in history where like everything's going this way and then suddenly it changes. And uh, of course, written big in science fiction, that's like galaxies exploding and stuff like that, and the universe ending billions of years from now, which I just find fascinating because um, when I was uh, applying for grad school in uh, 
um, genetics. I was supposed to take physics as a prerequisite, and I never did. And I promised my committee that I would, and I never did. <laughs> and so I don't know anything about physics. Um, so like exploding galaxies, that's fascinating, and awesome to me. So you you've had a couple of like exploding stars and galaxy stories uh, in the last few years, and that's really cool. And so more, please. I like I like giant things blowing up because that could be better. <laughs> I think we can make that happen. Yeah. Um, okay, so I would like to turn to the audience now. Does anyone have questions for our authors? Why not? My, I guess, question and comment is for Leah. Um, I also have four children, and I think your story kind of inspired, I think, a similar vein, uh, but sort of culturally, like, Lots of black parents have very strong opinions about <laughs> uh, things that you should and should not do, and doctors' opinions that you should and should not follow. So I just thought that was such a unique way to uh, tell a story about parenthood. And some of the, I think non-parents don't know how much unsolicited advice you, <laughs> you get. And it also reminds me a little bit of The Lobster, uh, that movie with, the <laughs> right, with um, it, it'd be a great adaptation. So if you have like a screenwriter friend, Thank you. Thank you. But but I guess the question, um, you already answered, you know, that it started more seriously and it kind of went into chick lit, which I think is perfect for a tone, you know, and maybe kind of gets overlooked for the content, but the tone of it is so relatable. So, you know, how did you did you immediately kind of jump to uh, adapting it again after reading that book, or was it something that you had to kind of convince yourself of because of the negative connotations of like chick stories? So this was a story that I had actually put aside for a while because I it had gone through three versions, and you know I couldn't none of them were right, um, you know, and I I just I knew that none of them were really working, and eventually I just kind of like put it aside, and I was like, and I have stories that I put aside and never picked up again because I tried to do something, um, and it didn't work. So I thought this was a story that I had put aside, I tried, I couldn't get it to work. Um, and it had actually just been lying in trunk for like, I don't know, probably three or four years when I read that book. And, you know, I, I can't tell you like what it was in my brain that made me like remember that story at that moment and think, oh, now I found the right tone for it. But basically I, I dug it up. I mean, the advantage of having written a story three or four years ago is that it doesn't bother me that much anymore. I just like threw the whole thing out <laughs> and started over. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Yeah, some exercise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in, in doing research for this story, did you find anyone advocating a licensing, licensing for parents? And if not, why not? <laughs> um, so I think I, I can't, it's something I've definitely seen thrown around. Like most of these lines about how, you know, you wouldn't give a massage without a license, but people can have kids, you know, without, I, I've seen people say that sort of thing a lot, again, mostly on Facebook, which is where people annoy me the most. Um, and one, one of the things that surprised me when I sent my original, very serious version out for critique was that everyone was like, well, this is clearly a very horrible idea that nobody would ever advocate. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it's the sort of thing that people say, but maybe they don't really mean. Any other questions? <laughs> Could you tell me what genres you read when you read outside of a uh, science fiction genre? What are your guilty pleasure reads? Can you share? There exists literature outside of science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, that's what I read and, and science articles, so I'm kind of one dimensional, I guess. I'm with them. I read science articles when I don't read science fiction. I always hesitate to call anything a guilty pleasure because I feel like everything has its virtues. Uh, I'm currently reading uh, A Memory Called Empire by Arcadia Martin, which I definitely love uh, giant, ridiculous space opera books like a lot. I really love and like these books a lot. Again, I would call it a guilty pleasure. 
Uh, it's very much outside what I would personally write, but I enjoy it a lot. And I mean, I read a lot of graphic novels, which supposedly for work, but oh no, they happen to be also really fun, so it's fun. <laughs> Uh, also an enormous amount. I, I will read Zero for like six months and then I'll spend a week reading nothing but like all of the fan fiction all my friends have told me to read. Uh, and I'll be like, all right, got that out of my system. And then, uh, yeah, I think I'm due for another one of those. Uh, well, I guess I already answered it, so. Yeah. <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> another question in the back. Hi, thanks. Sorry I couldn't be here earlier in the day, but um, I was just wondering, so many of our students here and elsewhere where I've taught always say that reading science fiction for them is what really opens up their love of reading. So I was just curious if any of you had, if you would have your writings taught in classrooms, how would you perhaps hope that students or those facilitating the reading of your text might bring out your text in the classroom space? in the classroom. Uh, wow. Something to that effect. Um, it would be interesting to see um, hard science fiction used in a science classroom as a way of, um, okay, we're you know, learning you know, biology, and hey, look, this is a story about sea life, and it's real stuff. And so I, I'd like to see you know, science fiction used in a science classroom rather than a literature classroom. Yeah. Well, this is something I've never really thought of. So thanks for putting my brain onto something new. But it does occur that, like, just in terms of how it could be used, like my reading in particular, because I think it does teach on themes of, uh, of adaptation and pantropy. And that's something I, especially pantropy, like, if anyone, is anyone unfamiliar with that term? Uh, so it's ba basically the whole idea of rather than rather than terraforming a planet to suit humans, which is what has been done a lot in science fiction, it's changing humans to suit the planet. And it's something that I haven't seen as much recently. So it's just an interesting thing to consider and that sort of thing, especially in terms of genetics, because this is really how you'd be doing a lot of this stuff. is that a lot of a lot of kids think that science is hard and scary and oh my god if I didn't remember exactly what the chemical formula for whatever it is I'm gonna get that wrong in the exam and that's that's terrible and and like science isn't just memorizing facts I mean it's like playing with the facts and seeing like what can you do with this stuff and it's fun and science fiction is fun and just having that attitude of, it's not about memorizing, it's about playing with stuff with your mind and just exploring the universe of possibilities. Um, I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. I feel like a lot of, and, and to be clear, I have no problem with this, but a lot of science fiction is all about things being really big and exciting and like yeah. really ridiculous, which is like very cool, but I think also, um, be, when I mean, there's a word like mundane science fiction that gets thrown around, which can be kind of controversial because people use it very differently. I like to use it to be thinking about how to write science fiction that is interesting and engaging, but like I said earlier, is very grounded in like the reality of what we can actually do. Because I, I feel like there's this way that a lot of people think that it's very boring, whereas especially um, writing nonfiction books about, for instance, human space flight, I think a lot of people because you have other things to do with your day. You have kids, you have a job, or kids and a job. Like You have other interests other than spending a lot of time uh, paying attention to what NASA is doing in a given day, and people become kind of detached about the reality of these things. And I like to do write fiction and nonfiction that kind of gives people a way to sort of both be grounded in, okay, like, Star Wars is really fun, but in reality, it's actually extremely difficult to put humans a significant distance away from the Earth. Like, we haven't sent a human more than, I don't know, 250 miles from the planet since like the Apollo era. Uh, we currently can. <laughs> we literally don't have a rocket large enough to go to the moon right now. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that, because why would you know that? Uh, and especially a lot of kids don't know that. So I feel like 
both being like, your idea of what we're capable of doing is probably much greater than what we actually can, but what we can do is really interesting and solving these problems is really interesting, I think is what I would love to have my work help teachers do. Um, um, I actually have written a couple of young adult fantasy novels, and when you ask that question, I'm remembering that teachers have occasionally tweeted me pictures of them using the novels in their class. I mean, my response was always just like to dance a jig, and not to be like, but how are you? <laughs> how are you using this in the class? Um, but if I had to guess, I'd say I'd like to write. This is more kind of from a literature rather than a science perspective. But I like stories and books where there is a really tough choice um, that the character has to make, and not a choice where like where you know the right choice is obvious to everyone, and you just have to see if the character can do it. But a choice where it's just really not clear what the right choice is. I mean, where different people reading the story will have different opinions about what the main character should have done. Um, so that's what I like. I like stories where kind of the human motivations and larger questions can be discussed and where there'll be legitimate disagreement among students um, about what the character should have done. Thank you. I think that is the perfect question to end on. It bridges the science fiction and teaching. Um, thank you so much so to our five wonderful, talented